Greetings, everyone, and welcome to our panel uh, on Transfer for Transformation, How Not to Bridge the Gap Between Academia and Policy, co-hosted today by Bridging the Gap, an initiative dedicated to enhancing the policy impact of contemporary international affairs scholarship, and by the German Institute for Global and Area Studies, GIGA, and their project on, transformation, on Transfer for Transformation, a program for exchange between scholars, policymakers, media, and the public. I'm Nazneen Barma. I'm an associate professor at the Joseph Korbel School of International Studies uh, and a co-director of Bridging the Gap. I'm going to introduce our distinguished panel uh, and uh, we will get going um, uh, after that. So he, we have with us here today in alphabetical order, James Goldgeier, who is a professor of international relations at the School of International Service at American University. Uh, he's a visiting fellow at the Center on the United States and Europe at the Brookings Institution and at, the Stan at Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation. We have Amitabh Matu, who is professor in the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and honorary professorial fellow of international relations in the Faculty of Arts, the University of Melbourne. Amitabh has also been a member of the Indian National Security Council's advisory board and advisor at the cabinet level to the Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir. We have Amrita Narlikar, Professor of International Relations and Professor President, excuse, excuse me, of the German Institute for Global and Area Studies. She's an honorary fellow of Darwin College, University of Cambridge, and non-resident senior fellow at the Observer Research Foundation Delhi, in Delhi. And we have Pro Professor Janice Gross-Stein, the Belts Beltsburg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science and the founding director of the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto. Janice is also an honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and a member of the Royal Society of Canada, among many other things. If I listed all of uh, my distinguished colleagues incredible achievements, we would be here for longer than, than we have time for. So forgive me for the short introductions. I also want to thank um, in particular, Julia Kramer of the uh, German Institute for Global uh, um, Area Studies and Catherine Urban of Bridging the Gap for their wonderful help in getting us here today. So the program for today um, is uh, is initiated in part by the reason why we, we have all come together was we were brought together by a special issue of the, the journal International Affairs, conceived and edited by Amrita and uh, Dan Dresner of Tufts University, entitled The How Not To Guide to International Relations. Each of our panelists contributed uh, to this wonderful uh, issue, which I highly recommend, and perhaps we could put in the chat a link uh, to, the, to the issue if uh, people haven't seen it yet. Each of our panelists contributed to the issue, and they're going to each speak for about seven minutes on the piece that they contributed. We will then have a moderated conversation, and I'd like to invite all of you uh, who are with us today, uh, thank you again for joining us, to put questions in the chat so that I can incorporate them into the conversation uh, that we'll have during the second half of the panel. So without further ado, Amrita, I'll turn to you. Uh, you're the one who got us all here in the first place. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Naz, uh, for that very kind and generous introduction and also for bringing us all together for this panel discussion. And a warm welcome to the panelists and all our participants on behalf of Team GIGA. And we're delighted to be collaborating uh, with, uh, with BTG. So how governments make use of scientific findings and whether or not electorates accept policy measures depend to a good extent on the knowledge transfer process between scholars and policymakers, as well as media outlets and the public. So knowledge transfer matters and policy advice matters. Unfortunately, the path of knowledge transfer, like true love, seldom runs smooth. Both the history and indeed much of the present of international relations is littered with foreign policy and governance failures. From New York in 1929, Munich in 1938, to Lehman Brothers in 2008, and the entire Doha round of negotiations in the WTO and more. And these failures on the ground often have some relationship with the world of academia, with the world of scholarship. As Keynes wrote so eloquently, and I quote, practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. Mad men in authority who hear voices in the air are distilling their frenzy from some academic scribbler of a few years back. 
So my wonderful co-editor, Dan Resner, and I came up with the idea of the How Not to Guide for International Relations, which was selected by International Affairs as one of its two centenary issues. And Dan and I had the great honor and pleasure to guest edit this project. The idea for the special issue was partly inspired by the Indian philosophy of Neti that uses negation to grasp the core of reality. And while we did not expect to cover the entire universe of the how not to in, of international relations, we hoped that by drawing on negative insights from a wide range of issue areas, we would be able to extract some interesting generalizations on the positives. By understanding what to avoid at the levels of both theory and practice, we might be able to devise better policies. We had a stellar team of contributors to work with, some of whom you see in this panel today, dear participants. And we also received tremendous support from Andrew Dorman and the entire team at International Affairs as the project moved along. And the result is this, um, and it's still available open access. So please do have a read it and uh, at the selection of articles that covers a range of issue areas. And together, what we've tried to do is we've tried to take a cold hard look at both the practical men and the defunct theories that many in our own métier may have fed them in good faith. In terms of bridging the academia policy gap, all of us as editors and contributors paid attention in particular to two issues. And the first one is that when asked about the limits of their policy impact, scholars tend to say that practitioners either do not heed their advice or they use it self in a very self-serving way or they use oversimplified versions of their analyses. And in our special issue, we recognize that some policy failures derived from the ways in which researchers conveyed and practitioners received scientific advice. But we're also convinced that it is high time that we as researchers also pay attention to an issue which has not received so much attention thus far, the inadequacies, biases, and hubris of academic analysis in the first place, which would have contributed to poor policy decisions irrespective of the filtration process between research and practice. While recognizing the importance of open-minded engagement with scientific advice by practitioners, we pushed ourselves and our scholarly peers to reflect on our own limitations and misjudgments. And this is also why this special issue was really special to work on because many of us reflected on the mistakes that we made. Um, and then I'll just say a little bit about some of the results of this the collective results, right? From both the empirical analyses and as part of the self-reflection exercise that we carried out as editors, as contributors. And some interesting insights emerged into what does not work. So collectively, the special issue shows that expertise generated in an ivory tower and nurtured in a technocratic bubble will usually not produce successful policy interventions. Engagement with those affected by the foreign policy actions is essential. And this is a theme that comes out in several of the articles in the special issue. Updated narratives are a key instrument to enable this. Both researchers and practitioners need to pay close attention to narratives, how they evolve, how they are appropriated, and how they are received by affected constituencies. Context matters. The articles addressing questions of US foreign policy, for instance, are especially clear that many lapses occurred as a result of the lack of local knowledge. Positionality matters. Foreign policy interventions, even if they fit all our academic theorizing to perfection, 
and meet the political requirements of leaders implementing them, they will still not be sustainable unless they also work and are seen to work for the people they affect. And ensuring involvement of countries from the global south is a key part of this. Practitioners need to be made aware of the differences of views within and across scholarly disciplines. And this is a theme that comes out very strongly in my own article, but I can talk about this perhaps in Q&A. But one, sort of, none of these lessons offer quick fixes for policy interventions in IR. But armed with this repertoire of insights on how not to, we think that both practitioners and their academic interlocutors will have a better chance of avoiding some of the worst pitfalls. And sometimes together, we might even get some things right. I'll stop there, Naz. Thanks for that terrific introduction, Amrita. Let's turn to Janice next, please. Janice, you're muted. There we go. Cannot have a Zoom panel without some idiot like me being muted to start us off, right? Uh, so thank you, Amrita. That was great. And just a special shout out to Virginia Gaff um, for what it's done over the years. Jim Morsa is a founder uh, of that and it tackles in many ways, I think, uh, one of the biggest challenges. Um, as Amrita said, there are no easy fixes here. And I would go further and say the problem lies much more with the academics than it does, um, unfortunately, with the policymakers. And so um, I, I wrote a piece, and I'm not going to talk about it now, so <laughs> because people can read it. So there's not much point um, in spending our valuable time on that. But it is a piece which uses scenarios. Um, and this particular set of scenarios were three alternative futures about uh, the kind of relationship the United States and China could have depending on political and economic conditions in both countries. It's actually interesting how practical uh, this has proved to be since I wrote the piece a year ago. Uh, because there are, um, and you can hear it in the policy discussion now, um, there are um, different ways of conceiving that future. Um, and so to me, um, scenario planning is really a great way for academics to get, to do two things, which actually in the special issue, I don't think we said strongly enough. Um, one is to speak a language that people understand. We live in a jargon inhibited universe and I don't think um, we made enough of a point of that. If you speak an exclusive language that 500 peers around the world can understand, don't be surprised that nobody pays any attention to you. And I'm not sure, James, you're, Jim, you're smiling. I'm not sure what the value add often um, uh, you know, are we get uh, uh, in a sense? I'm you know, you talked about scientific part of the problem is the use of quote scientific language when there's not that underlying science. Uh, that's a very difficult thing for social scientists to admit, especially in our field. But it serves to obscure and to exclude, and it's not it. it it guarantees <laughs> that nobody but 499 of my best friends. Uh, we'll know, in fact, what I said about something. So I, I think that's one that we just, and that is a deep problem of training and education uh, for the graduate community that we produce every day. There's a second issue that I want to point to, which I don't think we made enough of a mission of in the journal, in the special issue of the journal, which is the fundamental deep uncertainty which shapes most of the really important policy questions that we have to grapple with. The other side of that is hubris, right? Which I'm really talked about, but it's not simply hubris. Um, for many of the problems that I work on, which are war and peace problems, frankly, um, there is nothing but 
uncertainty. <laughs> and, um, and that's where scenario planning helps. As long as we understand what it's doing, um, it has to start by acknowledging the deep, deep uncertainties um, in which we operate. And so here's a practical piece of advice that I have followed myself um, in years of engaging with the policy community in several countries. When somebody asks me what the likelihood of something is, my first answer is, I don't know. Because I really don't. <laughs> The only way I can say anything else is to make the assumption, the false assumption, that there's some pseudoscientific probability distribution out there, of which there rarely is, and cover up the discomfort that we all have with uncertainty and answer the question. <laughs> and so I make a point of saying, I don't know. And speaking to Jim's work again for a second, why does that answer, I don't know, matter so much? Because one of the um, serious obstacles that policymakers face when they have to make very tough decisions in very short periods of time with serious consequences is overconfidence. Um, and we, we have good evidence for that. So part of the goal of academics should be to shake the confidence that anybody knows um, in anything like a scientific way on most of the problems that we face, because we really don't. So I, in the following on from this work that I did for the Special Journal, I've gone on and done um, a longer version, not on that problem, but not on another one, which starts from the assumptions of what I call radical uncertainty, which is something I face in my academic work, but something my policy colleagues face. Uh, but they have existential consequences for the decisions they make, which I don't. So I actually have an easier time than they do. And that opened up a channel of discussion um, which is iterative, going back and forth with policymakers. And it asks the following question, which I think um, is to me the bridging question if we're really interested in having conversations with policymakers. What can I do to reduce the uncertainty? Right? And that's going to be context specific, as Amrita said, it's going to be policy specific. But what can I do to reduce the uncertainty? Sometimes we can do something, sometimes we just can't. Um, and then to look at the consequences of being wrong in an uncertain world, because the likelihood is you're gonna be wrong in an uncertain world. And so putting in place a framework for people to deal on both sides of this relationship with what we don't know, it's not how not to exactly, Amrita, but it's a version of it because it is, what do we not know? And how important is that for framing a conversation between scholars and policymakers? And policymakers know some stuff that I don't, and I don't mean because they have access to better information, which they do, uh, but that's not what I mean. They understand um, why a decision is political. Why that matters for sustaining support for a policy over time in a way that I never will, because I never had the courage to engage in the kind of activities that they have engaged in. So we shared information. Jim knows the project that started this process off just before the um, invasion of Ukraine. Jim was a part of it. We've gone on. Um, and continued for a year. And it's a, it's a project that progressively shares what we don't know, very self-consciously tries to reduce the uncertainties if we can, and we have to find consensus on that, and then just struggles to think through together, not transferring because there isn't knowledge to transfer. There just isn't but struggling to understand together what the consequences would be if we were wrong. 
and trying to mitigate the worst of those consequences. It's a very different frame than the academic world. Uh, it's just used to working in, but I think it's worth talking about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janice. Some, some important kind of existential framing and, yeah. and questions there for us. Really very much appreciated. Amitabh, over to you, please, next. Whoops, you're muted too, Amitabh. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Naz, and thank you, Amrita, and uh, both to Giga and Bridging the Gap and the Cobell School. Thank you very much for putting this together. And uh, thank you, Amrita, and congratulations to you and Dan for putting together an outstanding issue and um, been honored to contribute to that issue. And I'm sure that that will have a shelf life, which will be probably longer than many of the books that all of us write. And I hope you can think of actually um, converting that into a book, perhaps, if International Affairs is so interested. Uh, but certainly in some uh, different iterations, uh, if we could give it uh, a more longer shelf life, then uh, maybe the case if it only exists as a special issue of international affairs. Having said that, Nas, I think you put together two questions. One is to really talk about our issue uh, or the, the highlight the main concerns of our pieces within the journal. And secondly, about bridging the gap, uh, really, what are the issues uh, about bridging the gap? Uh, uh, let me tackle the first, the latter first, which is the bridging the gap, and then talk about the rise of China, which was uh, what I looked at, and especially from the perspective of South Asia. Uh, in terms of bridging the gap, I think uh, there are two issues. One is uh, I mean, international relations really has been a conversation um, uh, or between great powers and academics, uh, primarily in privileged universities, about uh, great powers, their concerns, the international system. I, I make this as a generalization, conscious that there are obviously uh, been um, other writings, other trends, but primarily in terms of, you could think of a hegemonic discourse, it's a conversation about war and peace issues between great powers. With the result uh, that not only has scholarship from what we describe as a South, which is certainly not a homogeneous entity, uh, often been disregarded, marginalized, but also uh, that the ideas from the South, which should have actually impacted on a much more thoughtful discourse about great power issues has been neglected. And uh, how do you uh, transfer that knowledge from the South to the academic world and to the policy world in the North or within the great powers is one big challenge. The other big challenge is, of course, how do you transfer the knowledge from within academia of the South uh, to policymakers within the South? Let me give you an example of India. Uh, India is tightly in, controlled by a formidable bureaucracy, uh, which has been uh, inherited uh, from the British Raj. However, uh, on foreign policy issues, on national security issues, for the past 25 years or so, if you have had access to the political leadership, we don't have a spoil system like the United States, but if you have had access to uh, the top leadership of the, of the country, uh, beginning with Prime Minister Vajpayee in the early, uh, late 90s and early 2000s, to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, to Prime Minister Modi, you've been able to actually bypass, fast track your interventions in a manner that it's made a difference. Uh, it's also led to a degree of institutionalization because Prime Minister Vajpayee put together a National Security Council advisory board within the ambit of his office and which included academics like myself. So on key issues facing India, in the late 90s to today on uh, issues of national security, there's been consultation, there's been often given privileged access, and there's been a difference that you've been able to make, which is the nuclear tests, 1998, 
and the impact and how do you actually uh, try and use those tests as a way of leveraging your influence in the world rather than become pariahs of the world, the relationship with Pakistan and the relationship with China. And of course, uh, the relationship with the United States and how do you actually mend that relationship from the period where the United States sanctioned you to one where they are one of our closest partners. Now that scholarship uh, has often um, uh, made a difference, but is not often understood within uh, Western academia because that it does not have just a lot to offer to policymakers in India, but on issues like, for instance, the rise of China, uh, this, there are ideas there, there were ideas been there for the last 40 years, uh, which could have made us all uh, a more circumspect about China's rise than has been the case. Of course, because of the dominance of Western scholarship on China, and I, it's not something which is recent. If you, uh, I think there are anniversaries which are celebrating Edgar Snow's uh, uh, writings on China and the pictures, at least on Twitter, showing Snow with Mao uh, during the long march. So the, uh, Western scholarship on China is long and has been formidable, but it's also captured the imagination of parts of the South where a much more earthy perspective which sees China for what it is, which is within India, for instance, given that we share this border on the North and the West, and given that there are Chinese policies and evidence about 100 miles from where I am sitting, which is a formidable display of armor, incursions into the border, a unilateral declaration of a ceasefire, and then a demand to, as recently as of three days ago uh, that parts of the border be seen as a buffer zone, that there should be a 25 to 30 kilometers buffer zone, all unilateral. No. Now, Prime Minister Nehru, for instance, did initially get carried away by the idea of Afro-Asian unity, and he was the one who talked about Hindi, Chini, uh, Bhai Bhai, Hindi, Chini, uh, Hin Indians and Chinese are like brothers, and the idea of an Afro-Asian unity, and uh, with India and China occupying the leadership, uh, leadership positions, was something that he had internalized. But he quickly realized that the Chinese did not see India as either a partner, uh, nor were they willing to even uh, even accept the fact that India could be potentially a player within the region. So you had the 62 humiliation, but more recently, uh, humiliation uh, uh, in incursions, even while there was a dialogue taking place. But much of Indian scholarship till then had also bought into this discourse that China had been socialized into the international system, that China's rise was going to be benign. But many of us actually intervened in that debate in the 90s, especially after 1998. And even before Deng Xiaoping's, uh, Deng Xiaoping, uh, Deng, Deng Xiaoping's exit had led to a different, different leadership in China to suggest that China's rise was not going to be any benign. But that, those ideas, precious as they were, in the, if you look at it from the vintage point of today, were lost, were not, were not some, uh, I have attended conferences in Stanford, I've con attended conferences in, uh, in Harvard, many of these ideas were completely disregarded. How do you bridge these two gaps then? Uh, bridge a gap between influencing your own government, but influencing also the discourse and the policymakers in the so-called Western world. Um, having said that, let me flag finally a little trivial point that there is, a, there is an initiative out of Melbourne where I spend six months, which tries to at least provide a platform. And I understand that there's an American edition, which is also doing well, called The Conversation which tries to give a platform to all academia, 
even as they sit as biochemists, but intervene as physicians into daily problems that impact upon the world. It's a daily newspaper which advertises itself as academic rigor and journalistic flair. So it's uh, it's something that which I we are starting in India as well, and I would encourage you all to perhaps look and reflect on whether that's one possible medium through which we can intervene more effectively. But uh, let me again congratulate Amrita for an outstanding issue, and please convey my uh, congratulations to Dan as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amitabh, uh, for really important reminders about the, the importance of breaking into hege hegemonic discourse in many different uh, facets. So over to Jim next. And Jim, forgive me for not also mentioning in your uh, introduction that you are, of course, a uh, major, uh, formerly co-director and now senior advisor of Bridging the Gap, uh, the project. So Jim, thank you. Thanks, Nas. Well, you know, um, the piece uh, that we, Nas and I wrote uh, a piece together for this special issue, and we're so grateful to Amrita and Dan Dresner for including us, it was such a great exercise. One of the things we do at Bridging the Gap is to run training programs for PhD students and faculty on how to connect to government, NGO, and private sector actors, how to write for private and uh, for policy and public audiences, and how to develop media strategies, other things like that. And so forcing us to think about what not to do uh, was super helpful on uh, clarifying our thoughts on how we approach uh, what, we, what we try to convey. Um, I think it's important really to understand that it's not about believing that you're necessarily going to change a particular policy, but that you are utilizing your expertise to shape the way people not only in academia, but outside of academia think about particular problems. Um, there's so many ways to connect with policy and public audiences, uh, writing in outlets they read, um, and per Janice's point, using language that they can understand that's accessible. Uh, doing briefings uh, and being on point with those briefings, uh, testifying in front of parliaments or other official bodies, um, and then um, taking time away from academia to serve in government or at an NGO or at an international organization uh, or in an advisory board for, for one of those entities. Um, uh, Naz and I in our piece for the volume argued that in trying to overcome the perceived cult of the irrelevant, uh, the idea that academia is too disconnected. Uh, don't fall prey to the cult of the relevant. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. But an extreme situation in this regard is what Paul Musgrave calls lab leaks. This is the idea, uh, the notion that ideas, um, some ideas that when set loose in the policy realm can create havoc. Uh, and uh, he mentions the influence of the democratic peace theory on those who went to war in Iraq in 2003, and, and I'll also come back to that momentarily. But um, Naz and I came up with four eyes uh, to focus on influence, interlocutors, integrity, and inclusion. Uh, let me just say a few words about each of these on influence. Typically, there are at least three ways of influencing policy. One is to pursue a line of research that does have implications for how policymakers solve problems, uh, such as the impact of economic sanctions. Um, and I was interested in hearing Janice talk about um, shaking confidence, uh, reducing uncertainties. I think something like uh, the area of economic sanctions lends itself very well uh, to, to that. The yeah. um, second is changing the way policymakers think about the world. Uh, for example, nuclear strategists in the 1950s and 1960s uh, created new ways for policymakers to think about the world. And a more recent example is Henry Farrell and Abe Newman's weaponized interdependence, which I think has had certainly had a huge impact um, inside the Beltway in Washington, DC. Um, and a third way is to take knowledge directly into government, um, easier in the US context than in many other countries. Uh, there are other examples, but certainly in the case of the Biden administration, we see lots of people uh, who have gone in from, from outside, uh, as of course, it's always the case with political appointees. But in this particular case, lots of people with PhDs and academic connections uh, going in, um, particularly in the Department of Defense. Um, in general, it's important to try to play the long game when trying to shape discourse and practice, uh, establish expertise, identify where your scholarship connects with policy, be patient and build networks that will prepare you to engage uh, when the opportunity arrives. The most important thing is just to, is to not care about the limelight. I think that really in terms of how not to, 
don't focus on the limelight, focus on working behind the scenes. Uh, and we cite, you know, three people who I had such high regard for and unfortunately are no longer with us, but had a huge impact in the nuclear area. John Steinbrunner, Jan Nolan, and Bruce Blair. Most people will, these aren't household names. They had a huge impact um, with the kind of work they did. Uh, with interlocutors, um, you know, the goal is to connect with, with people who can have um, the type of impact, uh, with, with whom you can have the type of impact that you want to achieve. Uh, you know, don't set out a goal of, of reaching officials uh, on the seventh floor of the State Department or the Prime Minister's office or the Chancellery or, you know, the UN Executive offices, but connect with longstanding bureaucrats who move policy agendas forward over time. Um, What's interesting is that uh, increasingly policy relevant academics are conducting cutting edge scholarly work in deliberate partnership with actors in civil society in the private sector, uh, as well as in government. But there are things to watch out for here um, and particularly maintaining your independence. We have a great quote from Janice in our piece uh, about not shading your findings in order to preserve access. And I think this is something that people who wanna influence policy wrestle with. You, you wanna have access so you, you pull your punches, you you shape the way you, you, you know, this is something you really shouldn't do. You gotta be true to your results. Um, and for people who do field work, there's a lot of opportunities to talk to folks in government about, you know, things that you're learning, but that might affect your ability to do that field work in the future. So, um, you know, you definitely have to be careful uh, with that um, in terms of how people in the field may be reacting to what you're doing with the information when you go back home. Um, in terms of integrity, uh, thinking in advance and in explicitly ethical terms about how your research might be used by various actors. Um, for example, work on issues such as authoritarian regimes, mass propaganda, military intervention. These research can be used in ways not envisioned by those doing the research. Uh, as those working on the democratic peace found out, uh, you know, I mean, they were doing important and legitimate work on the democratic peace and there they were after 2003 with officials at the very highest levels uh, talking about uh, those ideas in the context of the Iraq war. Um, in our piece, Naz and I hi highlight two things about the connection between this academic work and the war. First of all, it's important to remember that the rationale for the war was the weapons of mass destruction. And only when those weren't found did the Bush administration look for something that they could draw on to say, oh, well, actually, you know, this is about um, building democracy. Um, and it's also, I think it's not really fair to blame these theorists who were trying to understand something about, something important about interactions in the international system. Uh, it's not fair to blame them for how I, their work has been abused, but it's helpful to remember that you need to think about how your work might get used. And I just, uh, Personal example, I was invited to a conference in China a couple of decades ago, and I, I was asked to write a paper on the lessons learned from the Soviet collapse. And I was thinking, well, I don't want to be writing a how-to guide for quashing democracy. So um, I actually found the experience incredibly uncomfortable uh, and tried to, uh, to do what I needed to do for the conference, uh, having been invited, but um, but but really think about how I was presenting um, what I had to say. Um, and then inclusion, I mean, making room for underrepresented scholars uh, to engage. Um, our former BTG colleague, Emmanuel Balogun has observed that, quote, tokenization and the lack of racial representation might lead to underrepresented scholars not receiving the opportunities for policy engagement because of a perceived lack of expertise, end quote. Um, responsible engagement means ensuring diverse identities and experiences are reflected in policymaking and the public conversation. And I wanted to just close with an observation regarding a feature that has perplexed Western leaders since the Russians launched their full-scale attack against Ukraine in February of 2022. And this connects with something that Amitabh was talking about and gets to the issue of inclusion. Um, it has been very perplexing for uh, many in the West, that so many in what we call the global South have not been on board with the Western view of this war as a war of imperial aggression. So the West talked about imperialism, 
Uh, you have the Biden administration in particular talking about democracy versus autocracy. Um, and I think that one of the things that's been really important over the last uh, year and a half is having scholars with expertise uh, on countries like India, South Africa, Brazil, others being able to explain uh, to Western policymakers why so many in their countries are suspicious of the West, see this war through a very different lens. Uh, I was just talking about the Iraq war moments ago, often invoking the Iraq war when saying, what is, who are you to be talking about imperialism? Um, and also, uh, you know, people in countries who believe their interests lie in maintaining uh, good relations with Russia. Um, it's very easy to be incredulous and critical of these kinds of approaches, but um, trying to understand what frames work by utilizing the expertise of scholars working on other parts of the world and from other parts of the world is essential. I heard a scholar of India recently saying, you know, st stop talking about imperialism, focus on the norms of territorial integrity. Um, you know, these are this is a much better avenue to go. And I, I think that demonstrates the importance of inclusion when we think about how to uh, shape the way policymakers are thinking about problems. Thank, thank you so much, Jim, and, and, and thanks for, for raising the kind of really important sort of example that we might talk about a little bit more of perceptions of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. I have a, a very general question that I'd like to pose to all of you. Um, would also like to remind our attendees uh, to please uh, uh, put into the chat any questions that you might have that I can work into the remaining uh, um, you know 15 minutes or so that we have for, for conversation, and, and thanks to those of you who have already uh, commented. My, you know, in listening to all of you, what, what what becomes very clear is that the bridging or sort of transfer endeavor um, has a series of audiences uh, that we're kind of thinking about, right? Where in the first instance, and this is sort of the evolution of our own project, we were talking about academics speaking to policymakers. Janice, you talked about that sort of in, in great detail and the importance of kind of conveying uncertainty. Jim, of course, you talked about that. What I heard both Amrita and Amitabh also emphasize is the importance of speaking to the public, not just to policymakers, and not just a public, but several publics. Uh, thinking about, in, in Amitabh's language in particular, the importance of sort of uh, bringing discourse from the global south into the, uh, you know, the ivory tower uh, of, of, of the west and so on. And so I'd like to invite you all to reflect, again, it's a, it's a broad question uh, on, on this, the, the sort of challenges that face us as scholars of speaking to that range of, of audiences um, and, and how you might have encountered that in your own work, because each of you has, has spoken um, uh, to all of those audiences uh, in, in your own work um, as well. I would also invite you to reflect on the many provocations that you've all offered here as well. So Amrita, let's start with you and maybe do a quick fire round of two or three minutes each and, and see where that gets us. Okay. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll go to the example, um, to a couple of examples from my own paper now, now which is on uh, uh, how, uh, how not to negotiate the case of trade multilateralism. And one of the things that that one of uh, one of the one of the arguments that I make there is it's not that there isn't knowledge out there. It's not that policymakers don't want to listen. It's just that they want to listen to a very specific set of disciplines, right? And in this case, this is um, economics and law. And indeed, the secretariat of the WTO comprises economists and lawyers, many of them with advanced degrees. Um, and this allows them to understand a certain part of the puzzle, it, but they miss out completely on a whole bunch of other really important issues that have to do, for example, with considerations of distributive justice, which is something that developing countries have been pushing for over decades. Uh, some and, 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 and there was a period when they were quite effective with this, right, during the Doha negotiations, for instance, but the Doha negotiations have failed miserably. Right. And uh, uh, the WTO is uh, is is not doing terribly well. And the, the, the developing world has lost a major forum where they were able to exercise their voice. So it's and and so it's about which are the disciplines that are getting the hearing. And if the WTO were more willing, for example, to listen to questions of ethics, uh, to questions of security, you might not get the crazy overuse of Article 21 that we're getting right now, 
right? Because this is a very narrow understanding of security in the WTO and has nothing to do with national security. It's got something to do with security of supply, right? Trade supplies have to be secure. And that's the way that they usually talk about this. Um, so it's about which disciplines and which are the voices that get heard, right? And um, and that's and so there, I very much agree with what uh, Amitabh has just said, right? That that it or, or to to pick up on just one one last point, picking up on Jim's point on Ukraine, right? In Germany, there was like in the in the early in the early phase of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, everybody was shocked. Why was India not speaking up? This is a this is a democracy. You know, we share values. What's India doing? And the answer was obvious, right? Look at in if if there was any attention to knowledge about India from India or about India, the answer was, well, there's a long history of reliance on Russia. There is heavy dependence on Russia on military supplies. India is in a very nasty neighborhood. So it's not going to be able to transition that quickly. Uh, so don't just sit there and criticize India for this. Think about what alternatives you can provide. But that was, it took several months in Germany to for people to sort of begin to recognize that, that, okay, maybe there is a different point of view, right? Thank you. Thank you so much, Amrita. I want to just pick up uh, and echo your point about sort of the, the disciplinary kind of dimensions of this as well, right? And in particular, the, the neoclassical economics kind of emphasis on efficiency is the value that is sort of above all other values in terms of the policies that might be proposed. And your point, you know, made very clearly that there are other values uh, that emerge from other disciplines and from other uh, audiences and publics, and justice might be something that is, you know, put above efficiency as a goal that we might seek. Uh, Janice, please, anything that you'd like to, to contribute. Just to follow on your comment, Nancy, I don't think it's so much disciplines as who within the discipline. There are many economists who are concerned with welfare economics, right? Um, they're very different from the old classical. So uh, there, I have many friends, lawyers, who work very hard on distributive justice and transitional justice, but they're not the lawyers that get in touch to the WTO. I wish it were as easy as disciplines, actually a much harder problem to solve from the outside when you're grappling with which communities you can, you know, in political science, we have huge diversity, frankly. And so it's often a matter of which perspective uh, rather than a solely disciplinary perspective. So let me make two comments, one following on, on Namrita's point and Amitabh about India. So uh, I think what's important here for thinking about policy knowledge, um, is to build on the academic networks that we have, all of us have. It was zero surprise to me on the top that India took the perspective that it did. It was, I was wholly unsurprised that Brazil took the perspective that it did. And, you know, and I, I thought the framing was unfortunate from day one, uh, frankly. But it was easy for me to say that because I've already have these policy networks, was to get an opportunity um, for my colleagues in India to make that argument, for example, to the Canadian government was a heavier lift. So part of what we need to do is to build on what I think every one of us have, which are really good global networks, which represent very diverse perspectives globally. So when the moment comes and the moment is not, that window is not, open very long, frankly. All of us are prepared to make the, the arguments that you made. It's, it's stunning to me, frankly, that this was a push. I, I don't understand why any Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the world would not have known <laughs> um, what India, how India was likely uh, to react. Um, and that, that leads me to a final comment. And it'd be interesting to hear, um, Jim and Maria, what you think about this. The more I think about this, the more I think transfer is just the wrong world. Because it's hierarchical. We know we are transferring to you. We wouldn't have that kind of conversation with almost anyone. We don't even think about teaching graduate students that way. Most of us speak about learning from our graduate students as well as educating our graduate students. I wonder if that word isn't you know, bridging is different from transfer. Bridging assumes traffic is going both ways. Transfer is one way hierarchical. I know, I'm going to tell you, and you ignorant policymakers, just listen to me. I think that's doomed. 
frankly. And it's still because actually I'm convinced we don't know half as much as we think we know, actually. But it's doomed for more subtle psychological reasons. That unless you're involved in the process of creating together, right? It's it's a really um, it's a dialectic interactive process where you're listening to what policymakers need to know. You're trying to think, well, how can how can I fit that question within my frame? And it is genuinely active listening and conversation that goes on all the time. That's not a transfer process. That's something very different. So I wonder, Jim, in the next iteration of bridging the gap, <laughs> whether we don't do some hard work here on the way we think about, and that, you know, on the, whether we don't evolve um, because they are grappling with really wicked problems. Um, with not that, not that the good ones, the better the policymaker, the less confident they are, frankly. Let me, Amrita, actually give you a chance to come in on that because my understanding of the way that Giga and you are using the word transfer is indeed a two-way exchange. And so please c come in and-, uh, and, and uh, You know, I think, Amrita, does two-way exchange convey something different to you than the word transfer? This is, well, first of all, this is a general term that is used in German academia. Yeah, right? I know that. So we yeah. have to, so, uh, and this is a grant that is, it's a theme, a thematic grant that we won and it's called transfer, yeah. right? But we have made it extremely clear that this is indeed, as Naz put it, a two-way yeah. street and it involves active listening. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, an exchange, right? I mean, I used to call it knowledge exchange when I came from the UK, okay. uh, but uh, that's not the language that is used. In were, you able to, were you able to push back against the German grant makers? Because that's the problem you're having, and I get the world you're in, is exactly the problem, though. That we fit into a discourse for good academic reasons, but we're still fitting in to something that doesn't serve us well. Well, we, well I mean, I think we've got like uh, several other fish to, to fry, including bringing in the voices of the global south. And, and so that's something that we are actually pushing for and we choose our battles. So if we, if we get the grant that enables us to do this, we'll take it and we will keep doing it in a two on, right. on with a two way approach in mind, which Naz of course knows about. Um, but uh, Additionally, I will I will emphasize very emphatically, and this comes through clearly in the paper of, by Jim and Naz, that we have to be very careful in how we do this exchange, right? I know a great many poly, uh, sort of academics who go native, you know, when they work with organizations, um, and uh, there there are all kinds of temptations that are that they tell us that Jim and Naz have pointed out we have to guard against as academics. So call it exchange, call it transfer, a rose by any other name, call it whatever you want to. But those pitfalls are there, right? And co-creation, sweet, very nice. But you have to be very careful that you are still speaking truth to power. And that's not always going to be easy if you're going to sit there and co-create everything. And I will, and I mean, I would also point out that, I mean, I, I agree with you entirely, Janice, in terms of their economists and their economists as a whole variety of them. But I think when what Naz and I are pointing to is the fact that in the WTO context, you look at positions that are advertised and you see which other disciplines being asked for. It's not political science. It's not philosophy. Mm -hmm. It's not general social sciences. And so even if you get people with more of, you know, more willingness to engage with a more developmentalist paradigm, that's not going to be enough. Right. I mean, and they try to do that with Doha and that's that was not enough. Yeah. So, yes, it's not that simple, but it is actually there is a simple answer to it. And then we can go into more complicated ramifications of which economists and which political scientists and which lawyers. Yeah. Right. But let's start by opening out to some of the other disciplines. And that's just the example of the WTO. I could give you similar examples from the IMF and the World Bank. Yeah. Well, let me just let me kind of pose a, a, a sort of a, a question and, and ask Amitab to come in on this because it relates, I think, to some of what he was talking about. Um, you know, and picking up on on Jim's point about the, the the discourse around Ukraine is that it's not just sort of you know discipline versus discipline; it's also sort of the dominance within disciplines of certain perspectives. Right. And of course, in the United States, at least, the structural realist perspective has 
dominated the discourse. And that's the, the, the position to which everybody else has to respond in the conversation uh, about Ukraine. Amitabh, you were making a similar point, of course, about uh, the conversation around the rise of China and so on. So please, let me ask you to, to jump in on this. Just want to reflect first on Ukraine. Uh, I think even from the kind of liberal point of view, there was a feeling within India uh, that uh, a condemnatory approach may uh, actually erode your leverage. Uh, India has had a special relationship with uh, Russia as the principal successor state of the Soviet Union and also had friendly relations with Ukraine, including with Zelensky and Modi. Prime Minister Modi spoke to both Putin and Zelensky, and there were backroom channels working to try and see if there was the possibility of a meeting between uh, the Russian leadership and the Ukrainian leadership facilitated by India in India, including in, in Varanasi. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, however, uh, quite apart from all the arguments that Amrita has also made, the Russian, uh, the Indian dependence on Russian arms imports, uh, the uh, the fact that um, uh, much of our oil comes through Russia, um, this long-standing relationship which goes to the 1950s when the United Kingdom and the Americans were trying to force a plebiscite down India's throat and have the Soviet Union's um, have the Soviet Union's uh, veto helped us, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan. Uh, Jim, uh, I think does, people don't realize or within academia and certainly within policy world, how much impact that's had on India, that Americans will unilaterally intervene and then withdraw and leave a complete mess. Because it's clear now that Taliban 2.0 is, if anything, a shade worse than Taliban 1.0. So they could well do that to Ukraine or fight uh, Russia to the last Ukrainian. Uh, I think uh, the, much of the argument has not been on the ethics of the war. I think everyone recognizes that the Russian war or the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine was wrong. But beyond the ethical, in the uh, realm of public policy and the academic attendant, the academic discourse, all these issues have come up. I know we're running out of time, so I'm just going to stop here. Thank you, Amitabh. I was just hoping that everybody wouldn't mind just sticking around. I've been a poor time manager. I apologize, but this is a wonderful conversation. So just let's take a few more minutes here. Let me ask uh, to, Jim to come in and reflect on any uh, parts of the conversation that you'd like to. And then Amrita, I'd like to invite you to, to close us out, please. So Jim first, please. Great, thanks. This has been um, really interesting uh, to hear everyone's perspectives. Just two quick points. One, Naj, you, you mentioned speaking to the public. And it's interesting, I think, you know, there's sort of different, there's different formats, there are different venues um, with, with very different kinds of, um, different kinds of situations. So one, for example, you know, one of the things I love to do across the United States is respond to invitations to come speak to world affairs councils. Uh, you're going to speak in a community, a lot of the people there who've joined the World Affairs Council, they're interested in international affairs. You know, they may be retired foreign service officers or military or, um, you know, business people who, you know, have different kinds of expertise. And so, you know, you've been invited in a, as an expert and you're you're exchanging uh, your ideas with them, um, you know, in, in a setting in which you're treated as an expert and, and you're treating them as people with, you know, they're informed citizens and they have their own expertise. Versus the broader challenge of reaching a public that is increasingly skeptical of expertise and, you know, often can't distinguish between someone who has expertise and someone who has zero expertise. And uh, I think, you know, that latter part, um, you know, can be a very difficult um, situation. Uh, you know, it's difficult for all of us. And then the other point I would just make um, on some points that have been brought up uh, one of the things, new new uh, things we've started in Bridging the Gap over the last few years is a project called New Voices in National Security, um, funded by the Raymond Frankel Foundation. And we this has been a really great way to bring, especially early career scholars, together with folks from uh, government and non-governmental um, uh, organizations and, and elsewhere. When we set we we it's a it's a sort of a day long workshop typically 
uh, we go to the policy folks in that area and ask them, what questions do you wish academics could help you answer? Then we identify people we think could help them answer the questions and ask those people, and again, particularly early our new voices, early career scholars outside Washington, uh, to write short memos in response to those questions. And then we bring the communities together for a conversation. And we found that the, the scholars and the practitioners have found this incredibly valuable. And um, uh, I think, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a great model. Um, it's been working for us and, and I feel like it's a way to create that kind of exchange and really try to speak to the things that they're most mm -hmm. interested in. That's, that's a key feature. That's a great program, Jim. I participated in that is That is one of the ones that I think is really working. Fantastic, a model for exchange. Amrita, any last words? For the panel, not just in general. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so something that you asked us and we didn't, I don't think we, Jim started picking up on this, uh, on you know engaging with diverse publics, right? And this has been a problem with a lot of multilateral governance, right? That it, especially in the technocratic organizations that somehow you think that you come up with the right answer and the people will understand this if they don't let them read one or you know economics 101 and i mean i've i've been in consultation rooms in the wto where they've said you know i'm not a pr person i'm an economist why do you want me to engage with the public right and this is why and this was in the in the in the trump years now when we were getting all that inv invective against multilateral institutions in general uh, so narratives matter engagement with people on the ground matters at different levels in different countries. Um, if the other thing I want to flag up is what we're doing here together today. And that's, you know, thank you so much, Naz and Team BTG, that we're doing this online, right? And this, you know, one of the big takeaways from the pandemic era has been that there is this platform available. We do need to think about our carbon footprints and we should be making all the use that we can of the online format too to enable access. Right. And this does help. So thank you very much. And my last sort of my last point is, of course, Team Giga will be working on call it transfer, call it exchange. Yeah, but we will continue to be engaged uh, with the real world with our research. Uh, we will engage sort of we will do research based policy advice and we would love to team up and do more with BTG as well. Uh, we do, for example, we have our people who are seconded to the federal foreign office, right, or some of the other ministries, and we do have an engagement on what are the issues that are of concern to German policymakers, right, but I love the way you're doing this and, you know, in, in a different kind of very systematic format, and so, you know, if there are ways in which we can collaborate, um, it would be splendid, and so hopefully I can say to our lovely participants, watch this space. Indeed, watch the space for more bridging, more transferring, more exchanging. Uh, please, uh, I want to thank uh, each of you and all of us together for a wonderful, stimulating conversation. Amrita, Amitab, Janice, and Jim, always a pleasure uh, uh, talking with you and look forward to the next time. I hope it's very soon. Thanks, everyone, and thank you thank for you. joining thank us. You, thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.